In this video, I'm going to quickly talk about another approach to the covariant derivative, which is the component definition. And this is used a lot in more engineering oriented classes. So this is a follow up to the flat space definition from video 17. A link to that video is in the description. And just as a reminder, the Cartesian variables x and y are going to be written as c1 and c2, and the polar variables r and theta will be written as p1 and p2. So in video 17, I introduced the covariant derivative in flat space, which is just the ordinary derivative. When we take the covariant derivative of a vector field, we use product rule to differentiate both the vector components and the basis vectors. And this expression is often written using the Christoffel symbols, which are defined like this. So if we have this vector field here, the covariant derivative of this vector field would be another vector field, which tells us the rate of change of the first vector field in a given direction. So if we take this first vector field and look for the rate of change along a radial line, which is a line given by a changing lowercase r variable, we would get this new vector field on the right. Notice that along a radial line, the vectors are getting a larger and larger component upward in the angular theta direction. And so for all these vectors along this line, the rate of change would be vectors pointing upward in the angular direction as well. So this is the vector field we get when we ask for the rate of change in the r direction. And if we look for the rate of change given by the angular direction theta, we would get this vector field. Now, one viewer pointed out that they had been taught that the covariant derivative of a vector field is a rank 2 tensor, which is basically something like a matrix. And they wondered how the covariant derivative could result in both a matrix and a vector field, since a matrix and a vector field seem like different things. It turns out that there's no contradiction here, it's just that we're looking at the covariant derivative from different points of view. The matrix point of view focuses on components. And I found that this matrix component approach is often the approach taken by engineering students. Whereas the vector field approach focuses on geometry, and I find this approach is taken more by students of pure mathematics. So since mathematicians like geometry, they really like writing out derivatives like this. This is the derivative of a vector field V in the direction of some curve parameterized by lambda. Mathematicians would really like this because it's just a curve and a bunch of arrows. There's no components or coordinate system here, we're dealing with purely geometrical objects. But of course, we can expand things out in a coordinate system if we want. We can expand the vector field into a linear combination of basis vectors using its components, and we can expand this lambda derivative using multivariable chain rule. And we can take this derivative using the product rule, getting a derivative for the components and the basis vectors, and we can rewrite this derivative of the basis vector using our Christoffel symbol notation. So this is the expansion of the covariant derivative in Cartesian coordinates, but we could also do a similar expansion in polar coordinates, or any other coordinate system that we like. But at the end of the day, no matter which coordinate system we use, all of these expansions all describe the same geometry, the same vector field v and the same curve with parameter lambda. These covariant derivatives describe the same geometry even if the components look different in different coordinate systems. Now if we look at this formula for the covariant derivative, you'll notice this i index here. So in 2D space, we'll often deal with two different covariant derivatives in the directions c1 and c2, which are basically the x and y directions. Since the c1 and c2 directions form a basis for all possible vectors in flat space, we can describe the covariant derivative in any direction using a linear combination of the c1 and c2 directions. You'll also notice that there is a summation over the k index here, and that's because both of these derivatives have multiple components added together in linear combination. So we could expand out the summation over k to get the full linear combinations like this. So you'll notice that we have all of these components here for the covariant derivatives. And what engineers like to do is to give these components their own symbol, which is v with a superscript k and a subscript semicolon i, where the semicolon indicates that we're getting the components of the covariant derivative in the direction of the ci coordinate. Or if you prefer, we could think of this as just the ith coordinate. 
Another possible notation for the same thing is taking the VK component and applying the Nabla symbol with a subscript I. So these two notations are how engineers usually write the covariant derivative. They focus on the components of the covariant derivative. So this would be the kth component of a vector field where we take the covariant derivative in the ith direction. So we can rewrite these covariant derivatives using this notation like this. So right here would be the first component of V when we take the covariant derivative in direction number one. And this would be the second component of V when we take the covariant derivative in direction number one. And the same things would apply here, but these are the components when we take the covariant derivative in direction number two. And we can store all of these components in a matrix like this. And this is why engineers think of the covariant derivative as a rank two tensor. The covariant derivative actually adds a covariant index to the tensor components. So all of these V components are getting a new lower index or covariant index. And the new covariant index results from taking the covariant derivative and looking at the components of the resulting vector field. So I'd just like to review what covariant and contravariant indexes are. So recall that basis vectors obey the covariant transformation rule. And because of that, we write basis vectors using lower indexes or covariant indexes, right? Recall that basis vectors are just partial derivatives of a position vector capital R in the direction of the coordinate variables. And to convert between the different sets of basis vectors, we just use the well-known multivariable chain rule. These partial derivatives here that do the conversion for us are the components of the Jacobian matrix for Cartesian and polar coordinates. Now, on the other hand, vector components are contravariant. If we take some curve parameterized by lambda, we can look at the vector field of tangent vectors along the curve by differentiating a position vector r with respect to the curve variable lambda. So this is a vector field of tangent vectors along the curve, and we can expand it as a linear combination of basis vectors, again using the multivariable chain rule. And depending on which basis we use, we'll get different components. And the components are just the derivatives with respect to the curve parameter lambda. And to convert between the components in different coordinate systems, we again just use the multivariable chain rule. And notice here we're using the components of the inverse Jacobian matrix to do the conversion. So since vector components behave in the opposite way that basis vectors do, using the inverse Jacobian matrix instead of the Jacobian matrix, we call vector components contravariant. They obey the opposite transformation rule, and this is why we often write vector components using superscripts, because vector components are contravariant. Now, when it comes to the components of the covariant derivative, we see that we have a contravariant index and a covariant index. So how do we convert between these formulas in different coordinate systems? Well, to do the conversion, we can just start with the familiar formula for the covariant derivative, and I'm going to actually write these basis vectors using the partial derivative notation. Now, I'm going to use the multivariable chain rule to convert both of these derivatives into polar coordinates. So I'm going to do that using the inverse Jacobian matrix components here. Next, I want to isolate for this covariant derivative. So I'm going to sum on both sides with the Jacobian matrix here. And the Jacobian and inverse Jacobian will cancel out to give us the Kronecker delta, which is kind of like the identity matrix. And since we only care about the Kronecker delta when n equals a, we can change this n index to a, since all of the other terms in the Kronecker delta go to zero. So just rearranging things, we end up with this formula for the covariant derivative in polar coordinates. So we can write out the covariant derivative in polar coordinates using the normal formula, or we can write the formula that we just derived on the last slide. And since both of these formulas are equal to each other, that must mean that the components are also equal to each other. So we found the transformation between these covariant derivative components. We see they are indeed a rank two tensor that requires one inverse Jacobian matrix and one Jacobian matrix. So just as we expected, they have one contravariant index and one covariant index. The inverse Jacobian transforms the contravariant index 
and the Jacobian transforms the covariant index. So just to summarize what I've talked about in this video, the covariant derivative of a vector field is another vector field that depends on the direction of differentiation. So if we look at the two main directions in 2D space, we actually get two resulting vector fields for the covariant derivative, one for each covariant derivative in the main coordinate directions. And we can write the components of these vector fields using this semicolon notation here. These would be the kth components of the covariant derivative vector field we get when differentiating in the direction of the ith coordinate. And to convert between these components, we use one covariant transformation rule with the Jacobian and one contravariant transformation rule with the inverse Jacobian. So these covariant derivative components with the semicolon form a 1-1 tensor, one contravariant transformation rule and one covariant transformation rule. One last thing I'll mention is that Christoffel symbols are not actually tensors. Christoffel symbols are an array of numbers with indexes, but they do not transform with the expected tensor transformation law using Jacobians and inverse Jacobians like this. Instead, they transform with this more complex law, which you can see here. And because of this additional term here, this is not the ordinary tensor transformation law. So Christoffel symbols are not tensors. So I'm going to go through a derivation of this law, but it's going to take four slides. So if you don't want to sit through all that, you can stop watching now. Just remember that the Christoffel symbols are not tensors. Okay, so we determined that this covariant derivative of a vector field V with respect to the PI coordinate can be written like this using the Cartesian covariant derivative components and the Jacobian and inverse Jacobian, or we can write it like this using the polar covariant derivative components. And writing these components out explicitly gives us this. Now to derive the transformation law for the Christoffel symbols, what we want to do is make everything on the left side of this equation look the exact same as the right side of the equation, except for these blue Cartesian Christoffel symbols. So we're going to need to transform these vector field components as well as these partial derivatives. So remember, vector components are contravariant, so we go from our old Cartesian components to the new polar components using the inverse Jacobian. And that means that we go from polar components to Cartesian components with the ordinary Jacobian. So we're going to transform these Cartesian components VB and VJ using this formula with the Jacobian, and we get this. So VB expanded to this, and VJ expanded to this. Also notice that I've expanded this partial derivative in Cartesian coordinates out as a summation of partial derivatives in polar coordinates using the multivariable chain rule. And we get an inverse Jacobian here since these partial derivatives are covariant. Okay, so what we need to do now is take this derivative. And since we have the derivative of a product, we need to use product rule. So we get a sum of two terms. In the first term, the derivative is applied to this other derivative, so we get a second order derivative. And in this other term, we just differentiate the vector components. Next, I'm going to take this partial CA by partial PI and distribute it into these parentheses. So we get a copy here and a copy here. Now notice here that we have a summation of a Jacobian with an inverse Jacobian summed with the index A. So these would cancel out and give us a Kronecker delta MI. And since we only care about these summation terms where M equals I, we can rewrite the M indexes as I's instead. Okay, now we're going to distribute this inverse Jacobian to all three terms inside the parentheses. And I'm going to drop these square brackets since we don't need them. And once again, we have a summation of an inverse Jacobian with a Jacobian using the summation index B. So once again, these cancel out to give us a Kronecker delta. And since we only care about these summation terms where k equals n, we can just replace the n index with k. And I'm going to do a bit of factoring. So notice that the first term and the last term both have VR components and have this inverse Jacobian partial PK by partial CB. So I'm just going to factor those out. And this right here is the main result that we wanted to get. So we showed that this covariant derivative 
could be written using the Cartesian covariant derivative components or the polar covariant derivative components, which would expand like this. And on those past three slides, we just showed that this can instead be written as this huge big formula. And on the left side, we have this vector component written with the R index, but on the right, we have the vector component written with the J index. So to make both sides match, I'm just going to swap the R and J indexes on the left here. And these indexes are just dummy summation indexes, so there's no problem with me swapping them. Okay, so these formulas on the left and the right are the exact same in every way, except for the Christoffel symbol terms. And since both sides of the equation are equal, we're forced to conclude that the polar Christoffel symbols are equal to this big huge formula here. So we've derived the Christoffel symbol transformation law. And if we expand this transformation law, you'll see that this part looks a lot like what we'd expect for a tensor transformation law with the Jacobians and the inverse Jacobians. But this formula has an extra part added on. So the Christoffel symbols are not tensors because they transform with the tensor transformation law in addition to this extra term here. So Christoffel symbols are not tensors and they do not represent invariant geometrical objects. So we can't make up some sort of Christoffel tensor that's independent of coordinates and can be written as a linear combination of a tensor product of basis vectors and covectors. Okay, so doing this is impossible. So in conclusion, we've shown that the covariant derivative components form a 1-1 tensor and transform with a contravariant rule and a covariant rule, whereas the Christoffel symbols are not tensors because they follow this different transformation rule here.